India is the most enigmatic of the major world civilizations. India is a dazzling panoply, like a mosaic that shows so many details and complexities as to appear like a thriving, diverse jungle ecosystem. With its thousands of gods, castes, countless ethnicities, geography stretching from the freezing glaciers of the Himalayas to the dry tar desert to the steaming jungles of Tamil Nadu, in terms of sheer human life, India is clearly the densest and most culturally rich place on the planet. Stretching back 4,000 years at least, India also is one of the richest histories of anywhere in the world. This is my humble attempt to understand Indian civilization. How did it start, what are its defining features, strengths, and weaknesses, and where is it now, and where is it going? Those are the questions of this video. Now, let's get started. Well, India is full of history, it also has some of those beautiful landscapes and craziest natural features. From the Ganges to the Himalayas, India is a truly beautiful country, and you can appreciate all it has to offer in the Magellan TV series, Wildest India, which takes you across the country to explore its most breathtaking areas. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service made by filmmakers with the best selection of movies and historical documentaries out there. They have content covering everything from geology to astronomy and from true crime to ancient history. Regardless of what your interests are, Magellan TV is something for you, be it science, history, philosophy, or anything else. Magellan's compatible just about any device and is 4K HD with no additional cost. Magellan TV is a great platform, so check out Magellan TV today and start learning about whatever interests you. What if all test viewers can get a one month free trial using the link in the description? So start watching Magellan TV today. Before we start this video, I want to be really frank with my limitations. Of the four major civilizations of Eurasia, of Europe, China, the Middle East, India is the one I know the least about. India is the hardest to understand area in the world, barring possibly Africa or New Guinea. When I started this series more than a year ago, I thought to myself, God, India is going to be the hard one to write. As this video continues, the reason for this will gradually become clearer and clearer to you all. This doesn't mean I'm uneducated in this topic, however. I've still read thousands upon thousands of pages about India. It just means I know how little I know. In most societies, I can generally understand why things happen, when I look at Xi Jinping, the premier of China's actions, or why Afghan men kill their sisters in honor killings, I can explain the logic that led to those choices pretty clearly. In other words, in the Muslim or Chinese worlds, I can get inside the heads of people to a better degree than in India or Africa, where I can see what happens, but I struggle more with the why. I've also never been to India. I planned a trip last summer, but I had to cancel it due to various family drama. That means I'm missing a personal connection to this society, in that I've traveled to most of the other civilizations I've talked to before about on this series. I generally think that a culture is best truly grasped by seeing it in person, and so for Indians in the audience, I'd like you to comment your own opinions firsthand. However, to balance out humility, you also have to have pride. In all honesty, India has some of the most unhinged nationalists I've seen of any country on YouTube. I'm not sure what the education system over there says, but I've seen them say a lot of things that are just straight up factually wrong, and I'm sure they're going to brigade this video. I will say that even though I know I can't understand India perfectly, that my opinions are based in fact and study. As in all my videos, I aim for the truth and honesty, both of which are blades that cut everyone. With that out of the way, let's get started covering one of the oldest and most profound civilizations man has ever created. It's kind of funny when you see large civilizations that existed for thousands of years with millions of inhabitants get pwned by the wheel of history so hard that people forget they ever existed at all and then get unearthed 4,000 years later by chance. That's what happened with the Indus Valley or Harappan civilization. The Harappan civilization lived from around 3300 BC to 1300 BC, or about as long as between Christ and the present, occupying modern Pakistan and stretching into India as far as Delhi. They even had colonies in Central Asia and modern Uzbekistan. In the Bronze Age world, we often act as if Egypt or Mesopotamia were the central civilizations. Well, there was legitimately no way the largest and most populous was not the Harappans. The Harappans are one of the very few Indiana Jones civilizations left, in that we know basically nothing about them, and so there are still great discoveries to be made to uncover more of their identities. We haven't cracked their written system, we know nothing about their social code. We do have a couple tells about their culture, however. Their cities were massive, without any defining buildings like big temples, palaces, walled fortresses, and the like. While they had a freakish amount of unity among material objects, 
objects from across their giant cultural region. This, in my opinion, suggests some kind of large autocratic empire, like the Chin or Assyrians, which would make sense given the region's flat, irrigated geography. Their art portrays their upper class being people who look relatively Middle Eastern, while the lower classes look more Dravidian and South Indian. They likely also spoke a Dravidian language like those currently spoken in southern India. However, the Harappans fell for reasons we don't fully understand. It almost certainly took hundreds of years and had many causes between change in the climate, social decay, and finally barbarian invasions. However, I think the idea that the next group in our cast of characters just happened to enter the region at the exact same time as the Harappans fell, by coincidence, seems moronic. These being the Indo-Aryans, they were tribes from Ukraine who had smashed across Eurasia with chariots starting around 2500 BC. They reached from Ireland to China and from Iran to Siberia, spreading their language, culture, and genes. They reached India around 1600 BC and crossed the Hindu Kush crushing the Harappans. The Indo-Aryans had a manly warrior culture, which the historian John Key once aptly compared to that of the Scottish Highlanders. They lived in clans, strongly believed in honor, were warlike and proud. The Indo-Aryan invasions have been politicized in a weird way in India today, which is kind of strange as an American given they happened 4,000 years ago. Indian nationalists like to say that they never happened with the Indo-Aryan languages starting in India, which makes absolutely no sense, given that we have direct lingual, archaeological, genetic, and mythological proof that the Indo-Aryans started around the Caucasus or Ukraine and then spread outwards. Also, there's this weird school that wants to call this a peaceful migration rather than an invasion, which also doesn't make a lot of sense to me. First of all, from literally everything we see in the historic era, especially from this Bronze Age world, war was omnipresent all the time, so why should the burden of proof be on a peaceful migration rather than a warlike one? This wasn't really an era in which peaceful migration like that of the Mexicans across the American border or Muslims into Europe happened much. The nomadic tribes have attacked India like 20 times in the historic record, so why is this time any different? Secondly, the Harappan civilization rapidly vanished with its cities torched right as the Indo-Aryans showed up. No nation ever gives up its culture willingly totally either, which is what would have had to have happened with the total dominance of the Indo-Aryan culture we saw later in Indian history. The fall of Rome seems to me to be a perfect model for the conquest of Harappan civilization by the Indo-Aryans. The third group that helped form India were the Dravidians. The Dravidians are the native people of India and are ethnically a mix of the Middle Easterners who migrated in with the invention of agriculture alongside the native Australian Aboriginal hunter-gatherer peoples. The Dravidians inhabited the forests of what is now India, while the Harappans were concentrated more so in modern Pakistan. The Dravidians were tribal farming peoples. The Indo-Aryans smashed across northern India, settling the region and creating the main divide in India today between the Indo-Aryans speaking north and the Dravidians speaking south, which maintained its local culture. In India, we see a north-south genetic gradient where northern India, there's more Indo-Aryan ancestry with Kashmiris looking by all accounts European, and in the south, it's almost entirely native Dravidian. India became a fusion of these elements of Indo-Aryan, Dravidian, and Harappan society. I'm kind of pissed off I can't go into more detail here explaining that process in the way I can for, say, Christian, German, and Roman influence making up the West, but the problem is that this process occurred 4,000 years ago, and so we really don't know that much about the exact details. However, I'll try to tease out a couple key variables. In the regions they conquered, the Indo-Aryans installed the caste system. In most Indo-Aryan societies, there was a social division between warriors, priests, and workers. In their conquered areas, the Indo-Aryans made themselves the warriors and priests and made the conquered the workers. It's probably more complicated than that, however, given the caste system is in fact strongest in South India, which the Indo-Aryans never conquered. I've seen some interesting evidence that the caste system predates the Indo-Aryans, in fact, with the Indo-Aryans just installing themselves into a pre-existing system at the very top. Given that it seems likely that the ruling classes of the Indus Valley civilization were a separate ethnicity than the ruled, I could see the Indo-Aryans just replacing the Harappans as a ruling class. This might be one of those things like reincarnation that the Indians have been believing or doing since the dawn of time. For those that don't know, the caste system entails turning social classes into what amounts to ethnic groups. There are four big castes, or the warrior, priest, worker, or untouchable caste, or those who do demeaning jobs. Inside those castes are further jatis, or even more specific categories. This gets into an insanely granular degree, with jatis for goldsmiths, railroad workers, blacksmiths, farmers, and the like. India has at least 5,000 of these different kinds of jatis. What living in a caste entails is that you will live with the job you are born with for your entire life. You can only marry someone of that very same caste, and you will 
live with your cast for your entire life. You will only associate with people of the same cast or have people of the same cast cook for you. Cast has been the fundamental reality of Indian life for thousands of years. As you can imagine, genetically the caste system has resulted in India splitting into tiny groups. Oftentimes, different castes in the same village are three times as genetically distinct as a Norwegian from a Sicilian, and India genetically looks like a mosaic of lots of tiny dots. Some castes of genetic bottlenecks, which means a small genetic pool, form not breeding out of group, going back at least 2,000 years, which should be physically impossible in an area as densely populated as India. Caste influences India in so many ways that it often gets really difficult to even quantify. The biggest, in a kind of indescribable way, is that makes India like to maintain the essence of a culture without integrating it, keeping its individuality. For some explanation, in the rest of the world you have big events roll through, compressing and flattening massive amounts of differences and creating cultural homogeneity. Examples of this include the Muslim Caliphate in the Middle East, the Roman Empire in Europe, and the Han Chinese Empire, in the cultural sphere also how Christianity ate the previous pagan religions. In India, just imagine none of that ever happening. Imagine if all the tribes that were in England at the time of the Romans, like the Brigantes, Iceni, Sentati, and then the attacking Germanic peoples like the Angles, Jutes, Danes, etc., all being castes that cannot breed with each other, keeping their distinct ethnic identities in the 21st century, thousands of years later. As an example of something like this actually occurring, look at India's indigenous peoples. These are groups the Indian government has marked off as indigenous peoples, like the Native Americans in the U.S., and have their own reservations. A lot of these groups are urban and do maintain their societies, even in cities. The Western equivalent would be if there was a native Iroquois community in the suburbs of New York that worked as construction workers. Then imagine that white people colonized America 4,000 years ago, and those Iroquois were still viewed as natives. There are still Stone Age hunter-gatherer communities in South India within miles of massive overpopulated farmland and megacities with some of the world's most developed technical sectors. I think it's best to view Indian civilization like the internet, a group of interconnected communities connected through methods so complex it's impossible even for an insider to fully comprehend them. This comes from the caste system, which then manifests this kind of structure across all of Indian society. Look at India's religious system, which has thousands of gods with countless local variations, and then each of those gods in turn has countless sub-avatars or representations that they can reincarnate as. Every aspect of Indian society is as complicated as it could be, broken down as locally as possible. I'm not going to sugarcoat things. I consider the caste system to be one of the greatest evils in history, crushing the human spirit under millennia of class oppression. I think it's obvious how something like the caste system would have held India back. It prevented there from being merit and people rising to the station they deserved. It held the individual back with countless social traditions and in many ways enslaved them to their families, preventing natural love and weakening the spirit of the society by bisecting it into so many blocks, thus weakening its collective will. As you all watch this video and watch India underperform against other civilizations, the top thing I will blame is the caste system. However, a very important thing to consider is that, at the bottom level, castes were democratic. The local caste communities, which managed how they worked, how they were taxed, maintained their own laws and standards and the like, were democratic, in which governance was elected and by consensus. Although India at the higher levels was almost entirely autocratic past a certain point, this democratic undercurrent is why India today is one of the most dynamic and stable democracies in Asia, and also why India has never seen the horrifying tyrannies you've seen in places like China or Japan. For the other elements of the synthesis between Dravidian, Harappan, and Indo-Aryan elements that made India, I'd like to compare India with a land both very similar and dissimilar, Europe. When the Indo-Aryans started on the Eurasian steppe, one branch went east into India and the other went west into Europe. In both places, they interbred with the local population, with more Indo-Aryan in the north and less in the south on both subcontinents. However, you start to see differences starting there. Firstly, both the Indo-Aryans and the native inhabitants of Europe, relatives of modern South Europeans, are white-skinned, and so maintaining a caste system didn't make a lot of sense since both invader and invaded were physically pretty similar. In India, where the natives were dark-skinned, a racial caste system developed much like that which did in the Americas. The other big difference being climate, which was temperate in Europe the same as the Indo-Aryan homeland and tropical in India which also meant that India had a higher population density than Europe. What all of this adds up to is that the Indo-Aryans were able to totally dominate Europe, so much so that we know literally nothing of the native cultures. 
there really aren't pre-Indo-European words in European languages. No pre-Indo-European place names, no myths from their culture, and you could go on. On a cultural basis, it's even bigger than the replacement of the natives by white Americans. In India, where the climate was deadly for the invaders and their war horses, where they were surrounded by tropical jungle, and the natives were so different that there was no kind of cultural replacement. Thus, we see much greater traces of the native culture in India than in Europe. The Indo-Aryans worship pantheons like the Greek or the Norse, with gods like Zeus, Thor, or Poseidon, or the original gods of the Vedas, or the Indo-Aryan conquerors of India, were like that. However, those gods like Indra, Surya, Vishnu, and the like were gradually subsumed into the native religion. Shiva, for example, seems to have been a pre-existing Harappan god, and the locals kept worshipping nature spirits while all of these Indo-Aryan gods fit into pre-existing native molds. The idea of reincarnation seems to be local to India, for example. An important example of this that took centuries is that India went from a warrior-dominated society to a priest-dominated one. When the Indo-Aryans arrived, the highest caste were the Kshatriya warriors, as befit a warrior people. However, over time they were displaced by the Brahmin priest class. This makes sense when you put India in the context of the time. Peoples of farmer ancestry were theocracies in the Bronze Age, as evidenced with the Egyptians, Mesopotamians, and early Chinese. Thus, as the Indo-Aryans assimilated into their new land, the priests would gradually gain predominance as they did. For some comparison of how much caste and the priests ended up ruling India, there are stories of the Portuguese reaching southern India in the early 16th century to find a low-caste king having to treat the Brahmin priests with more respect than even he himself, not making eye contact with them and not eating at the same table since the religious authority transcended the political. This happened in a very strange manner in which the priests got the kings to believe that religion was more important for a kingdom than actually ruling. In the early Indian texts, we see that the top thing a king could do, more so than winning wars, gaining great wealth, or managing the society well, was to have an amazing horse sacrifice, which was incredibly expensive and took years to set up. The priests had made the religion so complicated, with a lengthy series of expensive rituals, the saying went before Buddha that the priests acted as if the gods served them and not vice versa. We're going to go into more of the details of how India developed into a full-out theocracy later on, but to get there leads through India's crystallization into an urban society, one that resulted in the greatest flowering of spiritual achievement humanity has ever known. I find it funny we're already 20 minutes into this video, but we haven't even gotten to 500 BC. But that's the nature of a civilization as old and complicated as India. However, these tribes living in northern India started to develop a more and more advanced society over the first millennium BC, moving from a tribal rural culture to one with large kingdoms, trade routes, and complicated social structures. Around 500 BC, India hit something called the Axial Age, which was a period in history when Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, Confucius, Buddha, Socrates, and possibly Zoroaster lived at the same time. This was since as societies became larger, they had to develop new values so that people could cooperate in a larger scale. In India, this manifested in a brilliant era of religious creativity. India by this point already had developed a religious tradition centuries old. There were ancient texts called the Vedas, which were the oral traditions of the early Indo-Aryan tribes that are the starting point for Indian religion. Afterwards, the Mahabharata was composed around 1000 BC. For some comparison, the Mahabharata is pretty similar to the Iliad, with which it shares a fairly similar plot and was written around the same time, about two warring tribes fighting each other and all the heroism that that's involved with. However, to make this more complicated, the later Indians layered all sorts of moralizing on top of this, like the Bible, by using the story as a vehicle for religious moralizing and storytelling. It's kind of like Tolstoy's War and Peace, of which it is similarly insanely long, like a thousand or so pages, where the story is a vehicle for lengthy philosophic rants. The Mahabharata is the closest thing India has to a Bible. The Brahmins took these various religious texts and constructed a religious world view that was eroding by 500 BC, and that as the world changed, people looked for new religious truths. This resulted in a period of questioning traditional norms and philosophic creativity. India had every school of philosophy you could possibly imagine in this era, whether materialists who didn't believe in the soul, nihilists, monotheists, rationalists like Socrates, and everything else you could imagine. India in this era was in a time of profound political flux in which the smaller kingdoms of earlier times were subsumed into larger empires, the most successful of which became Magadha in the east. Over time, the center of India had moved from the wheat-growing modern Pakistan to the rice-growing Gangetic plain of northern India. There are some interesting comparisons of India to Europe in this era, in which India actually had republics like Athens or Rome, located in the Himalayan foothills and in the east, due to sharing the common Indo-European root culture. 
unlike Europe, where said republics came to take over the whole region, due to India's flat geography, they were conquered by large autocratic empires. In Europe, where the Indo-Aryan nobility was turned towards politics since the city-state allowed so many positions for leadership, in India, the dispossessed nobilities turned towards asceticism, religion, and mysticism. Many noblemen, without opportunity in a changing world, went into the jungles to meditate and gain wisdom. This created the classic Indian mystic tradition, which is the most developed in the whole world. Indian mystics have done the inhuman, like starving themselves, standing on top of pillars for weeks on end, living naked in the streets, and the like. Out of this chaos came Buddha. He was a non-Aryan nobleman from modern Nepal around 500 BC, started to preach his belief structure of awakening from Dukkha, which boils down in effect to that life is by nature painful, and that by desiring more things from life, we cause greater pain. Thus, by disentangling ourselves from desire, we can awaken from the cycle of suffering that is existence. Buddhism was a simple path of how an individual could remove themselves from a painful world. Buddhism was so successful for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, in a society in which the Brahmin priest class followed so many bizarre and self-serving superstitions and corruptions, it was an antidote of a much simpler and stronger belief structure. The new merchant and middle classes especially supported Buddhism for that reason. Secondly, in a society in which caste and the new large empires gave the individual very little power over their lives, the ability to disengage from the world must have seemed very liberating. However, as both the historians Amori during Akkor and Spengler have said, Buddhism's very success shows that the previous Brahmanical society had failed on a profound cultural level. Something that a lot of people don't know is that the 200 or so years after Buddha, from 500 to 300 BC, were an era of massive social change in India, one in which India had a pretty good chance of becoming a very different civilization from what it is today. As people stopped believing in the Vedic and Brahmin norms that propelled India for close to a thousand years, it caused social anarchy. Some Indian kingdoms saw French Revolution-style conflicts as the lower castes killed the higher castes. You also saw the mass conversion of the middle classes to Buddhism, which, like communism in recent years, became a vehicle to try to revolutionize the older country. And on top of that, you saw the old political systems fail to be subsumed into larger empires. In the chaos that came from Alexander the Great's invasion of Western India around 300 BC, which was otherwise a fairly unimportant and obscure event in Indian history, came the rise of Kautila and Chandragupta. Kautila was a professor of statecraft at the prestigious University of Taxila in northern Pakistan, while Chandragupta was an enterprising son of a killed chieftain. The two became friends, teamed up, and went into the forest, raising an army of bandits, and then from there on went about conquering kingdoms until they literally made the largest empire in Indian history, the Mauryans. The Mauryans are kind of like India's Roman Empire or Han Dynasty, their big classical empire that established how all future empires of that society would aspire to. However, the big difference being that the Han ruled China for 400 years and the Romans ruled the Mediterranean for 700. Meanwhile, the Maoryans ruled India for scarcely 100. To explain why, let me use a concept that brilliant political scientist Francis Fukuyama used in his book The Origins of Political Order, that China is a strong state and a weak culture, and India is the opposite. In China, the religion is weak and the state totally dominates the society, with the engine of the economy, art, politics, and the like originating in the state in China for the last 2,000 years. However, India is the opposite, in which the state is incredibly weak, but the culture and the religion is incredibly strong. In a society in which the caste system is so strong, thus pulling most people into incredibly local identities, as well as the dominance of the priest classes and religion, means that the state's ability to pull on people's loyalty is incredibly weak. Governments, whenever they would conquer an area, would follow the local customs created by the priests. This is aided by India's big political philosophy, created by Kautila, who we mentioned earlier, being totally cynical and realistic, meaning there's no idealistic political concepts that Indian political groups are able to pull on to mobilize and motivate people. For an example of this, let's just look at the Mauryans, which only kept a loose control over their various provinces. Unlike the Romans who established a massive road system with an extremely connected political system, the Maurians kept the previous ruling dynasties and political cultures. In fact, just taking tribute from their conquered peoples. Maurian control was extremely light. As a further example, the Maurians had no bureaucracy or structure to manage their empire. They literally had no records and put none of their administration in writing, instead doing everything purely by spoken word. Thus, is it any surprise that the second the Maurians stopped having incredibly capable leaders that their vassal states just stopped paying attention to Pataliputra? The unimportance of politics in India for most of its history is kind of shocking the modern people. For India before 1000 AD, or the Muslims with clearer records invading, borders are kind of unclear and we aren't really sure of what was going on in India politically. 
Most histories of India I read kind of skip on the actual dynasties, talking about cultural and religious events that actually resulted in real changes in India, rather than just the political dynasties that came and went without actually influencing the broader course of history. Another fact to consider is India's geography, which is for the most part dead flat, which means that no empire can really cement itself in a stable geographic position. At the same time, India is so large that no one state was able to dominate the whole subcontinent. This means that empires would rise, expand their borders more than they could healthily control, thus resulting in them overextending and then collapsing before another dynasty rises to do the exact same thing. The general pattern being a large disparate empire controlling or struggling to control northern India, while the isolated valleys of the south holding together a series of small states. The Mauryan dynasty marks the high point of Buddhism in India. The Mauryans were a new empire that stood in opposition to the old order and made Buddhism their official religion. However, as they collapsed, India had a conservative reaction that totally remade their civilization and created the direction that India would follow until the present. The anthropologist David Greiber talks about the Axial Age package of empire and monotheistic religion, both of which India was the only one of the main Eurasian civilizations to reject. India at this point took a truly massive change that would forever define their civilization as very different from the other main ones in Eurasia. In order to see what direction India would take, thus leading it towards the civilization it now is, watch the next video. What a faultist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check out my Pillar, Pearl, or Patreon. As always, thank you so much for watching, and have a wonderful day.